Go 124 is officially released and with it comes a lot of new features. But do these features actually make the language better? If you're new to my channel, my name is Melky. I'm a senior backend engineer at Twitch where I write Go, but also on this channel, we discuss all things Go related. We explore different Go tooling, we build with Go, and we overall check the status of the programming language. And today we got to check out 124. So go ahead and grab yourself a fresh install Go 124. I'm on go.dev slash install the official website for all things Go related from the Go team. You can see you can install for Linux, Mac, or Windows. I have it installed on Mac already. And before we explore all the new features of Go 124, I want to give a shout out to Anton Zionov, who created this very cool website for exploring the new features of Go 124 via this interactive tour. He uh, it built this kind of basing it off the official release notes, which we have over here. I was quickly just looking over them. And I think this is a really cool way to explore are the major things that I find interesting in the release. So I want to give a quick shout out to Anton for this. So I think the feature everyone's talking about the most is generic type aliases. I think this is a pretty interesting feature. So a quick refresher is a type alias in Go creates a synonym for a type without creating a new type. So you can see here, when a type is defined based on another type, the types are different. Now keep on, keep attention to type ID is just int, all right? So type ID here is not fully interchangeable with the actual int type here. As demonstrated through this example, we have var n, which is type int, and then var id, which is type id, both 10, but we get a compile time error when we try to do id equals n. Whereas in the example right below it, we have a generic type declaration as an alias of another type. So type ID equals int. And now this new type ID and int are fully interchangeable with one another. So I quickly wrote this code to demonstrate this example. So you can see I have this type list, which is a generic type definition here. And then before Go 124, this would cause a compilation error. So right now I'm actually using Go 123 for this. But you can see my list of this any generic type being declared as list T would throw an error. And you can actually see generic type alias requires. And you can actually do go debug go type alias equals one or unset. So in previous versions, this would throw an error. But in Go 124, now this is fully valid. And the reason why I like this is it adds a lot more flexibility to just type definitions across the Go ecosystem. Uh, I think it's a little bit just kind of simple and I think it's a more straightforward and I just think it makes sense that this is now allowed in the language. So yeah, I think it's a great feature. I don't think it's groundbreaking by any means. And I think the author here uh, also agrees with me. You can see Go124 supports generic type aliases. Um, so a type is can be parameterized like a defined type. For example, you can define set as a generic alias to a map with Boolean values. Not that it helps that much. So yeah, I think it's a pretty cool feature, but nothing too, nothing too groundbreaking. A improvement that I am excited about are Swiss tables. And after many years, the Go team decided to change the underlying map implementation. It is now based on Swiss table and it links to this design note for what Swiss tables are. If you're interested, the link will be in the description down below. But essentially, the implementation actually has improvements to how fast and how performant the Go programming language is going to be using maps. And I'm pretty sure that the Rust programming language also about six years ago changed the underlying map or hash to use straight Swiss tables for their language and they've seen improvements across the board. So this is like a direct performance improvement. You can actually see on the official uh, release notes that uh, changing to the uh, Swiss table on average has decreased CPU overheads by two to 3% across a suite of benchmarks, which is great. And if we go back here, you can see that directly for maps, that access and assignments of large maps has improved by 30%, assignments into pre-sized maps has improved by 35%, and then iteration is faster across the board by roughly 10%, and then 60% for uh, large size maps with few entries, which this is great. This overall makes the language faster. It makes sense to have Swiss tables now. If, if everything would be faster, you can iterate quicker. It's just an improvement overall in the right direction for the programming language. And before moving forward, let me know what do you think of Go124? What is your favorite feature? Let me know in the comment section down below and make sure you click subscribe. It helps the channel a lot as we continuously cover new Go content.
Another thing that I'm very excited about is the directory scoped file system access. This is kind of a minor one, but I personally have dealt with this a lot. And they've introduced this new os.root type, which restricts file system operations to a specific directory. So the open root function opens a directory and returns a root. You can see open root and then the, uh, the string of the directory. And now we have this directory with us that we can actually do a lot of methods on. So methods on root operate within the directory and do not allow paths outside the directory, which is great because if you ever dealt with reading different uh, files from a directory system or, you know, kind of this example where you go out of that scope, um, you can get lost, you can start downloading different things, or overall, your program may be trying to find a file that doesn't exist in that root node. So I think this is just a very nice to have quality of life improvement for when you're dealing with different uh, files uh, using Go. So this is, I think this is going to be very good. It's going to be very underrated. But for those of us who have dealt with this, know exactly how powerful this new root method does. And if I continue reading, Methods on root mirror most file system operations available on the OS package. You have the create, stat, uh, we have the remove, and you should close the root after you're done with it with the defer r close. Awesome. Yeah, this looks great. All right, and one more thing I'm super excited about is the omit zero values in JSON. So the new omit zero option in the field tag instructs the JSON marshaller to omit zero values. It is clearer and less error prone than omit empty when the intent is to omit zero values. So unlike omit empty, omit zero omits zero value time dot time values, a common source of friction. Yeah. So if you've ever dealt with passing JSON, whether encoding, decoding from your client, your backend, or between microservices, you have most certainly have felt the pain point of omit empty. And I think the author uses time dot time as an example, but I mean, we have seen this with so many different just built in data types for go for the zero value that default value where for booleans for anything like that, uh, it would just cause an issue, right? You can decode and marshal that JSON that you get. And even though it's omit empty, it would still default to the zero value, which could not be the actual data you want to pass uh, either upstream or downstream. So now with this omit empty, we don't have to, or this omit zero, we do not have to worry about that at all. And we can fully see how this works. So we have this type person struck with name uh, string and the birthday using the time dot time type with this omit empty. If we run this, we get this problem, this, this zero value for timestamps, right? And this is just gross. Whereas if we have now this omit zero, if we run this, now we actually truly don't have anything in the JSON. And this is truly, probably one of the most the feature i'm most excited about the omit zero for json is going to be a lifesaver if you're a person who writes a lot of http servers in go and communicate with lots of front ends like react or whatever it is this is going to save you a lot of issues when dealing with passing data and kind of struggling with that zero value that go defaults to Another feature that I'm super excited about that I think a lot of long time Go writers will agree with is the new benchmark loop. So from the standard library of testing, which I think is one of the best uh, testing standard libraries out of the box for any programming language. If you've ever tried to benchmark anything, you'd probably run this for range BN to iterate over the benchmark slices or functions or whatever you want to do to time things and compare it. And there's been a few problems with it. I don't think they have been like too problematic, but go 124 introduces a faster and less error prone testing dot B dot loop to replace the traditional for range B and loop. And you can see if you click in, we can check out the B loop here. So that's great. Um, and you can see that it solves a few issues that the range BN had before, such as the benchmark function executes once per count. So setup and cleanup steps run only once. Everything outside the loop doesn't affect the benchmark time. So that's, this is probably the most, you know, the best thing for it because there's some other, uh, you know, things that can mess up the actual timer that you're passing into your loop and through the range function that could contaminate your actual benchmarks. And then compiler never optimizes away calls to functions within the body of a loop. And I like this little note here, benchmarks should use either b.loop or bn style loop, but not both. I'm definitely going to be using the b loop because I think it's just made for exactly benchmarking. It would be kind of silly to use the range function at this point. So go 124 has a lot of different features that we can look into, explore. I unfortunately can't do it right now, but 
I did look at my top five favorite features. I want to give my overall impressions of the release. I do think that Go124 is overall an improvement to the language. I don't think type aliases is that significant. I think it's just a no shit duh moment to include. But I think the things that actually matter that are going to make the language better are the Swiss tables and the omit zero values in JSON, as well as just the quality of life functions of the benchmarking loop and probably some other things that I missed here. But overall, I think Go124 makes language better. I don't think it introduces anything that's too intrusive that makes people question the design of this release, such as previous releases. But I do think it, overall, it's a healthy release. I think it makes the language better, even though it might be slightly better, it's still better nevertheless. But I'm curious, what do you guys think of this release? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Do you think it makes Go better? And what do you expect in the future Go 125 release? Let me know in the comment section down below. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace!